get down to business. Today I'm carrying on in the series I began last week called the Holy Trifecta. Many didn't know what the word trifecta means because you're not a regular at the track. It's a gambling word. It comes from the world of horse racing, and it has to do with betting the correct first, second, and third in the exact order, and it's a long odds bet. So that's what we're building this little series about, and I'm calling it the Holy Trifecta. And if you go look that up online, this is what you're going to discover. The Holy Trifecta is to go skateboarding, snowboarding, and surfing all in the same day. In my opinion, that's the unholy trifecta. I'm a skier, snowboarders are gone over to the dark side, right? Derek's a snowboarder, all you have to do is look at him and you know that's true, right? And so anyway, the holy trifecta is found in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And the scripture says, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love. So we've been going through this, and last week I started with hope. My message was called Hope Floats. And the reason I started with hope and not faith is hope is foundational to everything about life. And the scripture tells us that it is the the anchor to our soul. And in the Proverbs it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. When you lose hope, your heart drops. If we have no hope in this world, I'm telling you, we have nothing. Would you agree with that? Without hope, what do you have in this world if you do not have hope? So there's this story about this Catholic nun, and every day she walks down the same particular street, and there's this man in a rumpled raincoat leaning against the brick wall. He's there every single day. And one day she decides she's going to do something about this, so she pulls out a $20 bill, and she writes on it, never lose hope. She hands the man this $20 bill, he merely nods and she keeps on walking. Now the next day, she's going by this man and she gives a big broad smile to him and he hands her $80. And she says, what's this for? He says, never lose hope. It placed yesterday, paid four to one, that was a good bet. It's a bookie joke. You get it, right? It's about, you know, religion and horse racing and all that. And I'm, you know, doing some odd weaving of those things together. And so the reason we started at hope was because hope is actually the basis of faith. And today we're launching into faith. And my message is called Faith Leaps. And when we look into scripture, we discover that all of faith is based on hope. And I'll tell you where I find that. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, the substance, faith is the substance of things hope for the evidence of things unseen. And so when it comes to faith, the very substance of faith is hope. Hope is where you start. See, faith is based on what you hope for, or in other words, what you don't have. It's not based on what you do have. I know that sounds you know, terribly simple, but it's true. You can't have faith for something you already have. Like I am not, I don't need to have faith that I have pants on this morning. Because I'm not hoping, you say, why are you bringing up your pants? Because pastors have dreams about preaching without any pants on. And so I don't need faith for that. I just need self-awareness. And every morning I walk out the door, I look down. If I got pants on, I'm good to go. I don't need, I don't need faith for that because I don't hope for that. I already have that. So hope is about what you don't have. So here's the question. Do you have hope for a better future? Do you have hope for better health? Do you have hope for healing? Do you have hope for better relationships? Do you have hope for better finances? That becomes the substance of your faith. Are you following this so far? That's why hope was so important. Now, the second part of this is this. Faith is the substance of hope for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is also about some things that you you hope for because you can't see them. And if you can see it, then you, it's, I know it's overly simple, but I don't want you to miss it. Then you don't need faith for it. You know, Woody Allen once said this. He said, faith would be a whole lot easier if God would just deposit a million dollars in a Swiss bank account on my behalf. And that's kind of how the world thinks. The world thinks, I will believe it when I see it. But faith works exactly the opposite. You will see it when you believe it. And so that is the sort of the essence of faith. Faith is based on what you hope for. And so today my message is entitled, Faith Leaps. And faith is always going to require you to take a step of faith, or sometimes a leap of faith, into the unknown, because it's the evidence of things unseen. So you are stepping out into the unknown. Now, how many of you would like to see Pastor Mark's absolute number one favorite movie clip? How many of you would like to see that? 
Okay, a few of you. You get the rest of you are getting it anyway. And you, and you know, this is like this is so my favorite clip. It's just it's going to say more about me than anything else, and it's going to offend many of your sensibilities. But I don't care because I'm doing it for my own amusement. And, and it comes from the movie, The Other Guys. I'm not gonna ask you if you've seen that movie. I'm not gonna uh, recommend that you watch this movie. It's actually about Will Ferrell and about Mark Wahlberg and they're in this, this cop precinct and they're the other guys. And the superstars in this movie are played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Samuel L. Jackson and they are super cops. And the first 10 minutes of the movie is about them and here's the favorite clip. I don't watch the movie. I just watch this clip over and over again. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just find that so funny. <laughs> we were in the theater, and then that thing happened, and I couldn't stop laughing. I laughed for the whole movie. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And, and any of you who have been around long enough know I put that line in the Easter plays all the time, including two weeks ago on Easter. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, partner? Aim for the bushes. <laughs> and I slip it in wherever I can. And you say, Pastor Mark, what is the point of that clip? There's no point to it. I just thought you would want to see it. <laughs> no, there is a point to it. And that's this. It was a leap of faith. Didn't work out very well for them. But here's the thing. People will live and mostly die by faith. And these guys, they died by faith, right? But the, we're not called to just die by faith. And you say, what do you mean die by faith? See, to die by faith is a good thing. That means that you die in faith and you know you're going to heaven. And that's a good thing. And most Christians I know, they have faith to die by. But we're not called to die by our faith. We're called to live by our faith. Paul said this, Galatians chapter 2. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. So it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in him who called me. And you see, the calling that we have, it's, it's great to die by faith. But we're called to live by faith every single day. And the most quoted scripture from the Old Testament in the New Testament is Habakkuk chapter 2. And it says the just shall live by faith. So we're called to live by faith every single day. So I need to tell you another nun story. I'm on a roll today with the nun stories. And so Sister Serafina, she's working amongst the Navajo people in Arizona. And she's driving out one morning to the reservation and her car runs out of gas. And there she is on this dirt road in the middle of nowhere. She's three miles to the nearest town. And she has out of gas and there's no cars coming by. So she realizes she's going to have to walk back to town, get some gas and come back. So she goes to her trunk. The only container she can find is a bedpan. And she takes the bedpan. She walks in the 100 degree Fahrenheit heat all the way to the town, fills the bedpan full of gas. She walks all the way back three miles to her car, still hasn't seen another soul. She opens up the gas cap, and she's standing there pouring the gasoline out of her bedpan into the car. And just then, the first vehicle comes by. A guy in a truck, he slows down, rolls down his window, and says, Sister, I admire your faith. <laughs> So here's where we're going to go today. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. And it's going to describe, I think, how faith works as clearly and succinctly as anywhere in Scripture. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence. Say confidence. Which has great reward. For you have need of endurance. Say endurance. So that after you have done the will of God... Doing the will of God is another word or phrase for the word obedience. Say obedience. obedience. So that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Here it is. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This is what we know from Scripture, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. One of the things that God desires from us is that we would have faith and we would take him at his word and we would believe him and we would trust in him and we would throw our lives at him to trust and believe and never to doubt. So how do we get there? And this verse tells us how faith leaps, how we take that big step or that big leap of faith. I'm going to throw it up on the screen, real easy to remember. There are these three words, confidence, endurance, 
and obedience. We're going to start with confidence. I'm going to spend most of my time on confidence because confidence is the key to faith. It's, it's probably the, the most important of all of these, that we have to have confidence. Now, here's, I need to make a distinction here because there's a difference between what I'm talking about with confidence and self-confidence, right? We're not talking about the confidence that Dr. Phil talks about, you know, the self-confidence, because self-confidence, as wonderful it is, as it is that you have confidence in yourself, if you have self-confidence, you get self-results, and it will get you so far. But here's the thing about self-confidence. It's not going to divide the Red Sea. It's not going to make the sun stand still. It's not going to heal the sick or raise the dead or do any of the miracles that Jesus did. What confidence you're going to need is God confidence. It's like the guy who goes into the library and he says to the librarian, could you direct me to the self-help section? She said, I could, but that would kind of defeat the purpose now, wouldn't it? <laughs> you all get that, right? And so, so let's talk about confidence. And there's self-confidence and there's God confidence. And I think there's no better story in scripture than God confidence than the story in the book of Daniel of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or as I like to call them, the three Jewish contractors, my shack, your shack, and a bungalow. <laughs> I, I'm never gonna get sick of saying that, so don't ask me to, right? So, so let's talk about these three guys. You know the story, Nebuchadnezzar came in, he sacked Jerusalem, and he took many of the young men as captives back to the city of Babylon. Babylon was the capital city in the, in the empire of Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar was the king. And so you have this moment where he's got the whole kingdom gathered in the city of Babylon, because he's pretty excited because he has built and erected a gold statue 90 feet tall to himself. And he called it the Trump Tower. Oh, no, wait a minute. That's that other story. I always get those two guys mixed up. My, my bad. Right? It's just a joke, people. Come on. <laughs> Chill out here. And so, so he builds this tower to himself, a gold tower, and he tells everybody to bow down and worship the image of himself. And so at the at sound of the music, everybody has to bow down, and the music plays, and the entire kingdom bows down before the image except these three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men stood ramrod straight. They were not going to bow down because they knew the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before you. And they refused to bow down to another image, to another idol, and they would not do it. So Nebuchadnezzar is hot. He's mad. And so he calls them forward, and he says, look, guys, I know you're new in town. I'm paraphrasing this. I know you're new in town. You don't know how this works, but when we play the music, you bow down to my image. So we're going to try it one more time for your sakes. And if you don't bow down, we're going to heat the furnace seven times hotter, and we're throwing you into the fire. And so <laughs> Shadrach says, we have no need to answer you in this question, because our God, whom we serve, will deliver us from your hand, and we will not bow down to your image. Wow, that is confidence. What kind of confidence? Not self-confidence, it's God confidence, right? Because they said, our God whom we serve. Their confidence wasn't in what they could do in that moment. They had no power in that moment. Their confidence was in their God who was going to deliver them from the fiery furnace. Once they said that, Nebuchadnezzar, true to his word, he heats the furnace up seven times, he calls the guards, and they take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they throw them in. Well, that's what we think happened with them, because the scripture says the guards, what happened to them? What happened? Anybody remember? They were consumed by the fire before they even got to the edge of the fire. They were consumed by the heat. So my question is this, if the guards got melted or died or exhausted from the heat, before they got to the edge of the furnace, then how come those three guys ended in, into the furnace? You know what I think? I think they jumped in. I think Shadrach turned to his buddies and said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? <laughs> Aim for the bushes. <laughs> I, I'm speculating, but I think I'm pretty close. And maybe it was just a big giant leap. Maybe they got pushed in, I don't know. But anyway, so the next thing, what, what we find out, we, they're down in the furnace. 
So, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, he's so happy. He's rubbing his hands in glee, and he can't wait to go look in the furnace and check out the crispy critters. And so he looks in, and to his amazement, they're walking around in the midst of the fire, and he says, did we not throw three men into the fire? For I see four men walking around in the midst of the fire, and the fourth man looks like the Son of God, this pagan king recognized that in the midst of the fire, the son of God had showed up. See, when you have confidence, I don't care what fire you're going through, God will show up by his side and be in your midst. So that, you know, how far, how far would have self-confidence got them in that moment? Right? You, know, you don't want to be like the guy who fell off the 10-story building, and as he passed the fifth floor, he said to himself, so far, so good. Right? I mean, that, that's self-confidence. These guys had God confidence, and they believed God was going to show up, and the Son of God showed up. So he brings them out of the fire, and he's duly impressed in this moment. And he looks at them, and this is what the Scripture says. It says, they were not harmed, their clothes were not singed, neither was the smell of smoke on them. You know what my conclusion to this story is? This was a story of three young men who resisted peer pressure and refused to smoke. <laughs> That's good, hey? Glad you're tracking with me on that. There, there, I gotta tell you this little story on this. There's, there's this grade three teacher and she's trying to illustrate this principle to the, the kids. And so she takes three jars and she fills one with smoke and one with alcohol and one with just air. And then she takes a worm and puts a worm in each one of these jars. After five minutes, the worm and the smoke and the worm and the alcohol are dead, but the one in the air is just wiggling around in the bottom of the jar. And she says to the class, what does this illustration teach you? Little Johnny put up his hand and he said, I know what. If you smoke and drink, you'll never have worms. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's where I'm going with this, is that faith requires confidence. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had confidence. We can have that confidence. But the big question comes, how do I get there? How do I move from self-confidence or lack of self-confidence? How do I move from there into God confidence? And I want to give you three things on this. And those, these will be quick points. I know, I'm doing a three-pointer in the midst of a three-pointer. I know I'm throwing you off here today. But I'm going to give you three quick points on that. How do we get to God confidence? And the first thing, throwing it up on the screen, is this. Is that confidence come from hope in God's promises. And I want to prove that to you from Scripture. And so, I mean, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. I want you to listen carefully to this. It says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Did you catch that? The confidence we have is anything we ask God according to His will, He's going to hear us. And so that's why we have confidence in faith, because we know what his promises are. And if we ask him according to his promises, we will know that he hears us. And therefore, you can come boldly into the throne room of grace because he has told us what to ask him for. Now, let me give you a famous example of this. I think it's one of the great faith moments in Scripture. And it has to do with the Virgin Mary. She had, of course, wasn't married, had, had not known a man. And the angel, Gabriel, appears to her and tells her that she's going to have a child, and this child is going to be the son of God, and he's going to be great, and he's going to sit on the throne of God forever. So she gets this, this grand promise, and she's bewildered, and she says, how can this be since I know not a man? Fair question. And the angel answers and said, the Holy Spirit is going to overpower you, and you're going to be with child, and this is going to happen. And, and the angel explains it to her. And these are the words that came out of Mary's mouth, and I don't want you to ever forget it. She said, let it be done unto me according to your word. Did you catch that? And whatever your word is, whatever your will is, that's the essence of faith. Confidence comes when we find hope in the promises that God's got for us. So that's the first thing. The second thing is this, is that confidence comes from remembering our past successes. We've all had past successes, have we not? <laughs> really, you haven't had any? We've all had past successes. Whenever people say, I don't know what I'm going to do, Pastor Mark. I'm in this situation. I don't know if it's going to work out. I say, just remind me, has God ever showed up for you before? 
Has he ever answered prayer for you before? Have you ever been in this situation before and God has come? And almost every time, yes, we all have failures. Of course we do. I understand that. But we all have successes in our past. And I tell people, remember your past successes. And if you remember your past successes, I'll tell you what comes from that. A sense of confidence that rises up in your heart and your soul. I think one of the great examples of confidence in Scripture, and this will illustrate my point, is David and Goliath. Wasn't that a ridiculous story? What was David thinking? He's a 17-year-old shepherd boy that's never trained in military whatsoever. He came along, wasn't even supposed to be there. He came along like little Bo Peep, along with his sheep, to find out what's going on. And they're squared off, Israel is squared off against Goliath, who is nine feet, nine inches tall. The biggest warrior there ever was, a warrior from his youth. And he is challenging Israel to a one-on-one fight And even Saul didn't want to go. And Saul was head and shoulders above any man in Israel, and he didn't want to go. And along comes little David, and David says, send me in, coach, send me in. Why did he think he could do this? And in fact, Saul wanted to know that too. He said, why why do you think you're going to be able to take this guy? This is what David answered. He said, Your servant, when he took care of his father's sheep, when a lion or a bear would come, your servant would kill the lion or the bear, and so I will do the same thing for this uncircumcised Philistine. And that confidence that he had, that God would be with him, that this little shepherd boy had killed a lion, he had killed a bear, and now he was going to kill this monster, this giant, and even Saul put the whole future of Israel in the hands of this little shepherd boy because he was brimming with confidence. And where did that confidence come? From his past successes. So the first thing is this. It comes from hoping God's promises. The second thing from your past successes, which you all have. And the last and the final thing is by it, confidence comes by remembering that God is sovereign. Meaning this, he will always have the final word. Doesn't matter. He will always have the final word. You know, resting in the sovereignty of God, understanding that he is providential and he will always do his thing and always have his will no matter what it looks like along the road is so vitally important for us. So I'm going to illustrate this point with a story that happened in this church. It's kind of become one of those urban legends that is actually true. And, and here's a story. Uh, the woman's name is, is Karen. Karen was a single mom in our church. She was a waitress uh, by profession and a great lady. She's told me I can tell this story. So one Sunday morning, I'm doing a series on being an overcomer. And my particular message that day was that overcoming is an attitude. And, you know, you're not always going to have success and you're not always going to have victory in every situation you face in life. It doesn't matter. You are an overcomer by attitude. And if you will decide and determine in your heart that you're an overcomer. And I preached one of those messages I preach. You know, the ones where I get everybody wound up and lift them so high they have to look down to see heaven. You know, those guys. And so I was doing one of those messages that day and she was pumped. And then right near the end of the message, I said this. I said, you know what? I don't care what happens in your life. You need to remember you're always an overcomer and overcoming is a, an attitude. And you might feel 10 feet tall right now and you might walk into that parking lot and you might have a flat tire on your car. What are you going to do? And you're going to say, I'm an overcomer. That's what you're going to do. So Karen was elated. She was pumped and just stirred in her heart. And she walked out those doors and got to her car. And guess what? <laughs> she had a flat tire. She had a flat tire. So she said, I'm an overcomer. I'm an overcomer. And she went to her trunk and she opened the trunk and her, her spare tire was flat. And she said, I'm an overcomer. I'm an overcomer. So then she got her in her car and she did something she should have never done. She drove down the street with a flat tire to Canadian Tire. You should never go to Canadian Tire. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. I used to work at Canadian Tire. That's why I, I'm the man I am today. Uh, I can give Canadian Tire and God the credit. And so anyway, the, the point I'm making is you don't drive on a flat tire. You know that. But she didn't know that. So she, she drove on the flat tire all the way down to Canadian Tire just at the corner there. And guess what happened to her tire? Yeah, yeah, the guys know. She ruined it. She ruined her tire. 
don't ever drive on a flat tire. So anyway, now she's got no spare. She's got this wrecked tire. She has to buy a new tire. So she's out some 200 and something dollars. And so she's not having a good day. And she's, I'm an overcomer, driving home, I'm an overcomer. And uh, so she goes to work that night. She works as a waitress, I told you. And that night, she has these, this couple come in and they have dinner and whatever, and it's going well. And at the end of the night, they do the dine and dash. You know what that is? That's skipping out in your bill. And they go out to her particular restaurant. If someone does the dine and dash and doesn't pay their bill, the waitress pays the bill. So now she's out $57, another $57 in one day. She does not feel like an overcomer in this moment. And she decides to do the only sensible thing the next morning. She phones up her pastor to give him a piece of her mind. So she phones me up and says, Pastor Mark, I want to tell you about that message yesterday. You stand up there walking back and forth and waving your hands, talking about being an overcomer and how an overcoming is an attitude. What do you know about overcoming? You're not the one who went to the parking lot and had the flat tire. You're not the one that someone stiffed you out of $57. Well, I tried to be as compassionate as I could. But I still had to laugh because it's pretty funny, right? And I said, I'm sorry, Karen. It's just so funny. This is going to make a great sermon illustration for next week. But let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. So I prayed for her and she calmed down. We're friends and she loves me a little bit. And so, <laughs> and so, so, so the next weekend, I told her I was going to tell a story. So the next weekend, I'm still preaching on being an overcomer. And I, I tell her story. And I tell her how about the flat tire and being out $57. And, and I say, look, people, it doesn't always work out. Life doesn't always work out in the, in the moment. But you've got to remember that God is faithful. And you are still an overcomer. So then at the end of the service, you ready for this? This complete stranger, never met him before, never saw him again in my life. He came up to me, he pulled his hand in his pocket, he pulled out three $20 bills. And he says, you give that waitress this $60 to recover the 57 she lost, and tell her that God is faithful. It was an amazing moment. You know what I did with the $60? I, I kept it. What would you do with it? <laughs> She's not going to know. What would you do with it? No, I'm kidding. Of course, I didn't keep the $60. And so I, so I gave Karen the, the night. She wasn't there that week. And then the next week, she was back. I couldn't wait to give her the $60. And I gave her the $60, and I told her the story. And I said, this guy said, tell that waitress that God is faithful. And then she just started crying. And I thought, I don't understand this. When, when the bad thing happened, and she was sad, she cried. And now she's happy, she's crying. And I thought, I'm really struggling understanding women. You, you cry when you're happy, you cry when you're sad. It's, it's been a real learning experience being a pastor. But here's where I'm going with this, was that God was sovereign. And God took care of that. And it had nothing to do with anybody. It was just so cool. Wasn't, isn't that a great story? You should be cheering right now. So that's why confidence is, is so important to this journey. And that's the main thing I want to talk about. But let me spend a, a couple of minutes on these other ones. And so the second one is endurance. The writer says, you have need of in, endurance. And see, we don't really like this one, the endurance one, right? And you know why we watch Jesus? I think Jesus is a poor example for us. Not he's a poor example, but did you notice that all his healings were like instant? And every time he prayed for someone, they were instantly healed or instantly restored or instantly raised from the dead. And Jesus gets way better results than I get. How many of you have noticed that? And there's, a, there's a reason for that. That's because he's Jesus and you're not. That's why you don't get as good as results as him. And we have this example of Jesus. He had a short period of time, so he had to get her done. And uh, we kind of have all the time in the world. And God wants us to have endurance. And sometimes when you're having faith, you just have to endure through the hard times. I'm sorry to tell you, it's just the truth. So last week, God tell you this story. It's really cool. So last week, there's a man, his name is Phil. And uh, Phil came up to me. I'd preached on hope last week. And he came up and he was feeling a little hopeless because what had happened was his ear felt plugged or blocked and he lost his hearing completely. He was deaf in one ear. He went to the doctor and the doctor cleaned it out and irrigated it and did all this stuff. Hearing didn't come back. The doctor says, I don't know. I don't know why you've lost your hearing. I cleaned your ear out. I'm not sure. He says, you know, put some oil in there. Maybe something will happen. I don't know. He said, so he's really discouraged. He said, Mark, you don't have any idea what it's like to be deaf. And that's true. He said it was so discouraging. So he came up and he said, you know, the Bible says to call for the elders of the church and they'll pray for you. So he says, will you pray for me? I said, sure. So, 
So, so I, I thought, I ain't going to do what Jesus did. Jesus like, used to like, spit on people and stick their fingers in their ears. So I decided to give him a wet willy. Uh, so you know, I gave him a wet willy. Everybody, everybody wins at wet willy, right? What, you don't know what a wet willy is? What, what world did you people grow up in? The wet willy, it's iconic, for goodness sakes. So no, I didn't give him a wet willy, but I did stick my finger on his ear. I would have liked to have given him a wet willy. OK. And so, so I put my finger on his ear, and I prayed for him. And after I prayed for him, I, I said this to him. And I said, you know, Phil, I think by the next time I see you, your hearing's going to be back. So he goes home that night, and he's not happy about this prayer. Because he's saying, I'm not going to see him for another week. I don't want to be deaf for another week. He was expecting that he came in confidence. He was expecting that I would pray for him, and he'd be healed instantly. Boy, he hasn't been around long, has he? And so, so anyway, so he goes home. He's kind of discouraged because his ear didn't pop open. He was hoping to be healed. So, you know, the next day went by. He wasn't healed. The next day, he's sitting, he's watching television with his wife. And all of a sudden, his ear popped open. And he could hear. Got 80%. By the next day, he was 100%. And he sent me an email he was so excited about. It. He sent me an email. He said, this is, this is so exciting for me, Pastor Mark. He said, I was, so, was kind of discouraged. You said, next time I see you. And God healed me like two days later. And I thought about it. I thought, I know why God healed him two days later. Because God is sovereign. And God does things in his own timing when he wants. And you know what? Uh, if, if he had been instantly healed, Phil would have somehow thought that maybe I had something to do with that healing. And I didn't. All I did was pray. And God, in his perfect time and in his perfect moment, popped his heel, he, ear open and he was healed. And that's why you need endurance. Now, the trouble with telling that story is you're thinking, oh, I get it. I have to wait two days. <laughs> no, that's on the short end of this story. Uh, if you look into scripture, you discover that almost every hero of the, of the faith had to endure before they ever got. That's why you have need of endurance, and then you will receive the, the promise. And you're going to have to wait it out. It's just going to take some time. It's, it's just the way, the way it is. And you look into scripture. Oh, my goodness. Hebrews Hall of Fame. It's in Hebrews 11. And it lists these famous people of faith. And one of the key in, in first persons is Abraham. And it talks about by faith how he had a child in his old age. How old was he when he got the promise? Anybody remember? I heard it. 75 years old. How old was he when he had the baby, the child Isaac? A hundred. How many of you are good at math? How many years is that? 25 years. And he was a hundred. How many of you think you'd start losing hope at about 95 or 97 or 99? It took him 25 years. That's a long time to wait. You're thinking, I'm going to be dead before my wife gets pregnant, which is another story. But, <laughs> but, you, but he had to endure. And you know, there's a lot longer cases and a lot longer endurance stories in Scripture than him. One of the next ones in the Faith Hall of Fame is the, the story of Noah. And um, it says, by faith, Noah built a boat. He built an ark. Anybody know how long it took him to build that ark? Anybody know? That's correct. It was a hundred years. How come it took him a hundred years to build the ark? Because it was really big. And he didn't have any power tools. And he didn't have a generator. He didn't have any of this thing. And he had to make it really big to fit all these animals. And as it was, he didn't make it big enough because he didn't have room for the dinosaurs. Right? We know how that ends, I guess. And, and, and so anyway, a hundred years goes go by. And where was he building? In the middle of the desert. And so he's building this stupid boat in the middle of the desert. And all his friends are coming by and saying, Noah, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a boat. Why? We live in the desert. He says, well, one of these days it's going to rain. To which they said, what's rain? <laughs> you know it had never rained. Go read the book of Genesis. It had never rained. The water came up. The dew came up from the ground to water the earth. It had never rained, ever. And he's building a boat. And they said, what's rain? He said, well, there's going to be these little drops of water. And they're just going to fall from the sky. And there'll be so much of it, it's going to fill the whole earth, and you're all going to drown. Well, that's a good story, Noah. Good luck with that. And so he keeps that going for 100 years. That took a lot of faith and a lot of endurance and 100 years of building the boat. And then finally, one day, the heavens, they opened, and the water came down, and it filled the earth, and it did exactly what he said was going to happen. And it wiped everybody out but him and his pets. 
on the ark, right? There's a story about this man. He goes to southwest uh, Saskatchewan, and he sees how dry it is, and the crops are all withered up, and he says, doesn't it ever rain around here? He says, remember that story in the Bible where it rained 40 days and 40 nights? Well, that time we got half an inch. <laughs> So, you know, we look at these stories in Scripture, and there's actually one even longer. Again, the Faith Hall of Fame, Hebrews chapter 11, and it's the story of Joseph. And it says, by faith, Joseph made mention of his bones when he was dying. Joseph, that was his claim to fame. I mean, he had been the, sold off as a slave, and all these things happened. He ended up being the prime minister of Egypt under the Pharaoh, and he's recorded for having mentioned his bones upon his death. He said, what's that all about? Well, I'll tell you. Go to Genesis chapter 50, and he turns to his family on his deathbed, and he says, well, don't bury my bones here in Egypt. When you go back to the homeland, you take my bones and bury them in the homeland. And then in J Joshua chapter 24, it says they came into the promised land carrying Joseph's bones. Anybody know how long that was? 430 years. I know what some of you are thinking. You're going, Pastor Mark, I don't know if I have that much time. <laughs> yes, you do. You have all eternity. You don't necessarily get all the answers to all your uh, promises in this lifetime. We live by faith, and sometimes we die by faith. So the first thing is confidence. The second thing is endurance. The last and the final thing, often forgotten, is obedience. And he says, after you have done the will of God, you look into Scripture, almost every act of faith required an act of obedience. Remember the 10 lepers? They came imploring Jesus to heal them, and he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, as they obeyed, they were cleansed. Remember that story? What would have happened if they hadn't gone to show themselves to the priests? Would they have been healed? No way, no how. And we know this because we can look back in the Old Testament and find the story of Nahum. And Nahum was a leper, and he came to Elisha, and he says, well, Elisha, will you pray for me? Elisha not, didn't even come out of his house. He was busy watching a hockey game. He was watching the IHL the Israeli Hockey League, and he couldn't get away from the TV, and he just sends this message to him, and he says, tell him to go wash in the Jordan River seven times. And Nahum was hot, and he wasn't going to do it. And he says, why would I wash in the Jordan River? Aren't there greater rivers in Damascus? And his servant said, Master, if he had asked you to do something difficult, would you have done it? Hmm, he says. So he goes and washes in the Jordan River seven times, what happened? His leprosy was gone, and his skin became as soft as a baby's bum, more or less, right? He did what he was supposed to do. Last story on this, just driving this point home, is that the first miracle, the miracle of Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine, they'd run out of wine, Mary comes to him, and finally she turns to the servants, and don't, if you only remember one thing, remember this. She turns to the servants and says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. That's obedience. So he says to them, fill the water pots full of water. They fill the water pots with water, and the water turns into wine. What would have happened if they hadn't put the water in the pots? No wine, right? Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Now, I'm going to take time to tell one final little story, wrap this whole thing up. You'll just have to bear with me here. So a number of years ago when we were moving into this building, we bought this building 20 years ago. And uh, it was a big step of faith to buy a building this big. We paid $2.7 million for the building. We needed a million dollars to renovate. And we were, were just nervy enough to ask you to pay for it. I don't know if you remember that. And uh, we were challenged. I was challenging people this. I, I thought, we're going to need a lot of money. And people can't give $100 or $1,000. We need to, them to step out in faith. We need them to take a leap of faith in this. So I, I challenged people this way. And I said, I want you to step out in faith and I want you to pledge. It's a faith pledge. You don't have to know where you're going to get it, but just make this determination in your heart that you are going to do something way beyond your ability and in faith in God's ability. So then I thought, I'm going to have to put my money where my mouth is here. And so Kathy and I prayed and we felt the Lord spoke to us about giving half of our annual income to this. I'll tell you what it was. It was $25,000. That made about $50,000 in those days. And, and that's, how do you live on half your income? How do you do that? But we decided we were going to do it. We are going to do it by faith, and God was going to have to figure it out. So, you know, we canceled our vacation. We didn't go anywhere that year, and, and we stopped eating out. And I had a boat, and I sold my boat and got, got double the money I paid for it. So we made money that way. So we just did all these things. 
Do you know within about eight months, we had actually already fulfilled our pledge of $25,000? I'm thinking, I don't even know how we're living. I don't even know how we're doing this. Somehow we've given away $25,000 in eight months and the year's not even over yet. It was a one-year pledge. So we said, let's keep going. And do you know by the end of the year, we had given away $35,000 to the building project? Because God will do over and above whatever you can think or ask. Whatever you think you can do, God will take you further. And whatever he asks you to do, do it. Because that's how faith works. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in Jesus Christ. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith leaps. Let's stand together. So I want to ask you all to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. And I, I know that in a room this size, there are people who have not made this decision, the first step of faith, which in many cases it's a leap of faith, to believe in a God that they cannot see. But this Jesus I talk about, you can't see him and you're not going to see him until you leave this world. But if you will believe now, you will see him when you leave this world. And if you've never had that moment where they, you've said yes, where you've, you've never had that moment where you have definitively uh, accepted the work of the cross. Jesus died on the cross and rose for you. And if you haven't done that, you haven't taken the very first step. And it's the most important step that you will ever take as a human being to invite Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. So with every head bowed, with every eye closed, if you're not sure where you stand, and today you're ready to make that step, that leap of faith into a relationship with Jesus Christ, nobody is looking around. It's between you and me and the man upstairs in this moment. And if you'd like to make that decision, I want you to just slip up your hand so I can see it. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to single you out. Take a moment. Thank you in the front. Thank you in the side. Thank you in the back. Anybody else want to join these folks? There's hands popping up around the room. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Anybody else? Yeah. All right. Super. Fantastic. You can all lower your hands. I didn't see everybody's hands, but that's okay. Uh, I'm not the guy looking. Jesus is. So let's all pray together, because I said I wouldn't single anybody out. And whether you raise your hand or not, if you're inclined, I want you to say this prayer. Ready? Lord Jesus, I thank you for the work of the cross, that you died for my sins, and you washed them all away. And then you rose again on the third day, and you forever live to be my Lord. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm a person of faith, and I will live by faith, and I will die by faith, because faith leaps. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a big shout today, shall we?